Uh, well, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Sandy Steingard. I'm a psychiatrist in the United States, and I have the honor and privilege of introducing our next keynote speaker, Robert Whitaker. He's the author of five books, three of which tell the history of psychiatry, Mad in America, Anatomy of an Epidemic, and Psychiatry Under the Influence. Prior to writing books, he worked as a science and medical reporter at the Albany Times Union newspaper in New York, for a number of years. He is also the publisher of a mental health web zine that I assume many of you are familiar with, manamerica.com. I know that I'm not alone here in being heavily influenced by Bob's work. In fact, I joke that I could spend the whole time talking about that influence, but I will restrict myself. Um, his heavily researched books challenge the predominant concepts and treatment of modern psychiatry. Almost what felt to me as a bomb to a largely critical and worrisome story, he ended anatomy of an epidemic by pointing a way to promising approaches that were more humane and reported outstanding outcomes. The chief among them was open dialogue. His interest in open dialogue was based on the fact that in stark contrast to common practice, antipsychotic drugs for individuals experiencing a first episode of psychosis were often avoided used in low doses, and long-term use was also avoided. In our meeting this week, we have talked a lot about the process of dialogic practice, as well as the challenges of starting services, continuing services, and doing research. But there's not been as much talk about the use of psychiatric drugs. Bob will bring us back to this issue in his talk titled, The Elephant in the Room, if you don't adopt selective use of antipsychotics, can you expect open dialogue to produce long-term results? I look forward to hearing him, and I will turn the stage over to Bob now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sandy. That was a very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here real quickly. Uh, where is it? Uh, what did I? <laughs> I've already lost it. What did I do with this? While Bob's setting it up, I just want to remind oh, people. I'm sorry about this. Q and A. Okay, you can all see that now, Sandy. You can see this. It, it, it came up, I believe. Yeah. So, so, okay. Thank you all for having me here. Thanks for the very nice introduction, Sandy. It's a real pleasure. Um, what I'm going to do here real quickly is explain why I was interested in, in open dialogue, how I came to it, and why, for me, the focus on antipsychotics was so critical. And we're talking about it within open dialogue as a treatment for psychotic disorders. So, as Sandy mentioned, I was writing a book uh, called Anatomy of an Epidemic in 2008-2009, and I became convinced that, on the whole, Here's what you could gather from the literature. First of all, that antipsychotics on the whole, in the aggregate, worsened long term outcomes compared to if you had a comparison group that wasn't treated but also given psychosocial support. And then that there were really three groups you could spot in the research literature that there was a significant percentage of first episode psychotic patients if they weren't placed on antipsychotics but were given psychosocial support of some sort they could recover and function fairly well over the long term. And when you really look into this, the estimates come up anywhere from 50 to 65% of a first episode never medicated cohort. Then there's a second group you see that can benefit from the antipsychotics for a short term, but then still if they taper off, they can function fairly well. In other words, they just use the drugs for a, a short period of time. And by the way, we're talking about patients diagnosed with schizophrenia or other psychotic disorders. And then there is a third group of patients that seems to really need the antipsychotic anti medication long term, and hence the, the need, if you want to maximize uh, long term, good long term outcomes, you need to have a selective use model. So I did a section of the book on what does the literature show us about the long term effects of antipsychotics. And then in the solutions part, I went looking for a system of care which had reported their outcomes in the, in the literature where they had used a selective use model of antipsychotics for psychotic patients. And lo and behold, I arrived at Open Dialogue. And there was an article that was published by Yako Sekula in uh, 2006. And when they looked at five-year outcomes, and here's what they reported 
And you see, so for me, a review of the literature told me a selective use model would produce better outcomes. And now here was a report of a group, a system of care that was using selective use uh, of, of antipsychotics for their first episode psychotic patients. And what were their results? Well, first of all, you see the selective use. 67% after five years, never exposed. Occasional use is 33%. Ongoing use at, at five years is 20%. That's a report of selective use of antipsychotics. And then look at the outcomes. Asymptomatic at five-year follow-up, 79%. Working or in school, 73%, et cetera. These are outcomes that are so much superior to conventional outcomes with uh, regular use of antipsychotics on a regular basis for people with psychotic disorders. So for me, this became a moment of a, almost a proof of the hypothesis that arose from a review of the literature. Now, I think as Sandy mentioned, so much as open dialogue has been adopted and people learning this, it's been a focus on the dialogical processes. And I don't think there has been as much attention in to this selective use of antipsychotics and maybe even sometimes just not worrying about it and not paying attention to that and it just going along with whatever the regular use of antipsychotics is. And what I want to do here in the next 15 minutes or so is, is just look at what the literature tells us about the long-term effects of antipsychotics and why they may be worsening long-term outcomes in what ways. And there's the, these negative effects really can break down into three parts. First, you get the side effects, the adverse effects from receptor blockade. So what antipsychotics do, primarily the first mechanism of action is blocking dopamine pathways in the brain, but they also block other neurotransmitter pathways. And it's well understood that that blockade of receptors, that thwarting of normal passing of um, you know, messages down these neurotransmitter pathways will have some side effects. And then you have two others. You have drug-induced dopamine supersensitivity. This is something that arises when the brain tries to compensate for that blockade. And then third, you have evidence of brain shrinkage over time, which might be described as a, as a neurotoxic aspect of, of, of antipsychotics. So this is just a description of, of how when you block different receptors, what sort of side effects you get. Now, dopamine, for example, there's three main dopaminergic pathways in the brain. One goes to the uh, basal ganglia. This is an area of the brain that controls motor movement, and that's why you get Parkinsonian symptoms. Now, the basal ganglia has other functions as well, but that's a primary one. There's another pathway that goes to the limbic system, and this is the part of the brain where we mount emotional responses to the world, and that's why you will see many people on antipsychotics saying, oh, I feel like a zombie. I feel like I, I, I just can't care about the world. That's because you're blocking this pathway that is so critical to mounting emotional responses. Now, the third pathway goes to the frontal lobe, which is so key to executive functions, et cetera. So you're also um, dimming the, 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 the neurotransmitter pathway that helps that part of the brain function. And then there, here's an example. This, I just took this from a, a, a research journal saying that the newer antipsychotics, the atypical antipsychotics, they block all these different type of receptors, serotonin, histamine, muscarinic, and adrenergic. And they said, these are the side effects that are associated with the blockade of those types of receptors. And so you'll see weight gain, diabetes, sedation, blurred vision, memory problems, cognitive problems, et cetera, as all possible side effects. So that's the first range of adverse effects or negative effects. It's just side effects from the drugs blockade of receptors. Now, the second part was really fleshed, fleshed out in the late 70s, first identified, and that's this. So, and by the way, I took these slides from a textbook. I didn't make them up. Um, this just looked at how neurons normally communicate in the brain. You have a presynaptic neuron, releases dopamine into that synaptic cleft. That's that gap between neurons that binds with receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And that's it's that passage of those molecules that causes the second neuron to fire. So this is how the brain works. Now, what happens is with you give an antipsychotic, the antipsychotic blocks those receptors. It sits in that, in that receptor protein. 
and therefore you can't it there's it, it that's how it thwarts the normal passage of, of messages messages but the brain being extraordinarily neuroplastic what it does it tries to compensate for that uh, perturbation of normal function uh, neuroscientists say the brain is trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium a normal functioning and what it does it increases the density of its receptors for uh, dopamine on the postsynaptic neuron. And it, you'll get anywhere from a 50% even to sometimes a 100% increase in dopamine receptor. So researchers said, this is, and this really came from two Canadian researchers, Guy Chouinard and, and Jones in, in, at McGill University, the brain is now super sensitive to dopamine. And they said that has two functions. They said it, Neuroleptics can produce a dopamine supersensitivity that leads to both dyskinetic and psychotic symptoms. An implication is that the tendency towards psychotic relapse in a patient who has developed such a supersensitivity is determined by more than just the normal course of the illness. To translate, they're saying you're actually making the brain more biologically vulnerable to psychosis over the long term. And once you go on these drugs and you have this new sort of this compensatory mechanism uh, in place now if you withdraw the drug you're going to be at high risk a higher risk of relapsing you would be normally because you have these extra density of dopamine receptors they put forth this theory in the 19 late 1970s 1980 then they tested it in their patients oh, what's going on uh, it seems to be locked up here um, and they tested it in their patients and they found that 30% of their outpatients showed signs of tardive psychosis, which meant uh, their psychosis was becoming chronic. And they wrote, when this happens, the illness appears worse than ever before. New symptoms of greater severity will appear. So this, this arises, this worry arises in the early 1980s. And you can see how threatening this is because antipsychotics are supposed to curb uh, psychosis especially over the long term as well. And here there was research saying we're making people more biologically vulnerable to psychosis than they otherwise would be. And that once they go on, it's going to be very difficult to come off. I don't know why that's going. Um, and now after that, in the 1980s, it was that, that worry was sort of pushed aside, especially with the arrival of the new atypical antipsychotics. But it's come back to the fore, and we'll see this as a result of uh, longitudinal studies of outcomes for medicated and unmedicated psychotic patients. Now, the th this, this third adverse effect to worry about arose in the 1990s once MRI technology came on to measure brain volumes. You could use this new technology to measure brain volumes. And a researcher named Nancy Andreessen, who was the longtime editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry, in other words, she was in the mainstream, she hypothesized, I think schizophrenia is a progressive degenerative disease that will be characterized by a, a reduction in frontal volumes over time. That was her hypothesis. She does this large study, I think there was 500 people, and she reports that's what you see. You see a decline in brain volumes over time. So then, then she looked at, uh, as this, you get the shrinkage in brain volumes and people diagnosed with schizophrenia, she found that this, it's associated with a worsening of negative symptoms, increased functional impairment, and after five years, cognitive decline. So she's putting together a, a picture of a process, of a physiological process that leads to a deterioration over time. However, the problem was there was research by someone named Rachel Gurr at University of Pennsylvania that said, oh, I think this, there's some volume changes related to the drugs. There was also research in animals, monkeys, uh, macaque monkeys that showed shrinkage. And of course the macaque monkeys did not have psychosis. So she goes and looks at her data and what does she conclude in 2011? This shrinkage is drug related. Use of the old neuroleptics, atypical antipsychotics, and clozapine were all associated with smaller brain tissue volumes. Severity of illness and substance abuse had minimal or no effect on brain volume. Now, this is a really upsetting finding, I'd say, because what you have here is a story of an outside agent causing a, 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 a visible change in brain volumes. 
and that change is associated with a worsening of symptoms and functional capacity. That's really a story of an iatrogenic uh, uh, effect of that, of that molecule or that, of antipsychotics. There has been um, a lot of more research on this, and you'll see in 2012, there was a review of 43 brain imaging studies. Researchers determined that loss of brain matter volume was significantly more severe in medicated patients. There's some thought that there can, it may be a combination that in, in, there, there is something with the disorder and stress may uh, cause some uh, loss in brain volume and then the drugs are accelerating it. And I'm pretty sure that I know Volkmer Adderhold uh, gave a talk earlier on. He reviewed this in an in-depth paper in 2014. And he says, you get this, these volume changes, which cannot be explained by the severity of the disease, very likely a manifestation of long-term effects of antipsychotics. And these adver can exert adverse effects on neurocognition, negative and positive symptoms and psychosocial function. And because of that, the guidelines for antipsychotic long-term drug treatment should be re reconsidered. And of course that reconsidered, if you do reconsider with this information in hand, a selective use model begins to make a lot of sense as a way to promote best long-term outcomes. Now, going beyond this understanding of the physiology, now we can look at long-term outcome studies that have measured recovery rates for those who take themselves off medication versus those who stay on. Now, the best long-term study we have of this sort was done by Martin Harrow and Thomas Job at the University of Illinois. Uh, they began their study in the late 1970s. And here was how their study was designed. They recruited 200 um, psychotic patients from two Chicago area hospitals, one public, one private, because they wanted to get a diverse group of patients. Everybody was treated conventionally in the hospital with antipsychotics, then they're discharged. And Harrow and Job are now just gonna follow them up periodically. They're gonna do a, a follow up at two years, four and a half, uh, seven and a half, 10, 15, and 20. And at each follow up, they're gonna do, they're gonna measure uh, what is, uh, you know, are they psychotic? How well are they functioning? And are they using antipsychotic medication? Now their hypothesis was those who take themselves off medication, this isn't a tapering protocol, it's a naturalistic study, this sees what happens after people are discharged. Their hypothesis was that those who take themselves off will do horribly because that's part of the conventional wisdom at the time. Now, at 15 years, they still have 145 of the 200 patients in this study. In other words, they're still following up on them. 64 were, had diagnosed with six, uh, schizophrenia, 81 with other psychotic disorders. And you'll see it's a young group, which is very important, half versus hospitalization. So we're really following a lot of people from early on in their clinical course. And what do you see here? First of all, you see at two years, there's roughly, I think, 25 of the 64 schizophrenic patients off medication at year two. They're both anxious, both groups are anxious, but look what happens between year two and four and a half. There's this dramatic improvement in the group off medication while those on, the compliant patients are remaining highly anxious. And what you see here, which you don't see in short-term trials or relapse studies, is a natural healing process going on between the second and the four and a half year period. Okay, you don't see that elsewhere in the literature. Cognitive function, you'll see it's better each time for those off, medic off medication. Long-term recovery rates, recovery rates was, uh, assessed in this way. You had to be asymptomatic out of the hospital and asymptomatic the entire year before the um, follow-up. And you had to be working or in school half time and have some good social function. So it was a, a decent social function. It was a sort of more of a comprehensive model of recovery. See the same thing. It's between year two and four and a half where you see this recovery happening in the off-med group, whereas you don't see it in the on-med group. And at the end, there was an eightfold higher recovery rate. Now they have just published a paper where they took into all accounts they could of differences in severity of symptoms, other sort of things that could affect outcomes. And they concluded that 
being off medication at any time during the during these 20 years, this was a 20 year thing, led to a six higher rate of six times higher rate of recovery being off medication. Here, there's just the spectrum of outcomes. You'll see off antipsychotics, 40% recovered, 44% um, fair, 16% uniformly poor. On drugs, much lower recovery rate at 15 years, but also many more in the uniformly poor category. That is a finding is cons which is consistent with drugs that would um, worsen long-term outcomes, that would cause like the brain shrinkage, diatrogenic effects related to dopamine super sensitive sensitivity, et cetera. Now, this is a really important study because he has two groups. He has schizophrenia and then he has psych people with psychotic disorders with milder, uh, uh, seen as milder disorders and therefore having had having a better natural outcome. And look what happens here. Schizophrenia, so the best outcomes are from bottom to top. So best is milder disorders off meds and global functioning. Next is schizophrenia off meds, which is better than mild dis disorders on meds. Now that is a finding that is consistent with the idea that antipsychotics over the long term worsen long term outcomes. They have iatrogenic effects. They worsen global functioning. Now he also then looked at people starting in year two who never took antipsychotics again versus those who are medication compliant. In other words, doing what uh, doctors tell them to do and look at the percentage of people with psychotic activity who are medication compliant. Two thirds at every follow up are psychotic. Whereas you see with the off medication group, they were psychotic when they went off meds, but then they healed off meds and you'll see this really low, but you see a lot of stability in the off med group once they got stable. Work history, much greater work history for those off antipsychotics, whoops. So what do we learn from Harold's findings? Those who stayed on antipsychotics were more psychotic. They were more anxious. They had worse cognitive function, much lower recovery rates, much more likely to have a uniformly poor outcome, had worse global outcomes. And then you get this where schizophrenia patients off antipsychotics had much better outcomes than patients with mild psychotic disorders. To my way of thinking, and this is the best long-term study we've we've had in the in the in the since the arrival of antipsychotics in the 1950s. If you read Harold's, they've now published six or seven papers on their findings. They are pointing to both this brain shrinkage as a problem and dopamine supersensitivity as a problem to explain these poor long-term outcomes for people who are uh, on antipsychotics compared to those who managed to take themselves off. By the way, those who took themselves off, they did it without support from their therapists. They were doing this on their own. They left care. And the, the brilliance of this study is Harold and Job looked those people up. They followed them once they exited uh, psychiatric care. Since that time, um, well, some of these are before, but there's now a number of studies that are, are pointing to the same finding. In the World Health Organization studies studying schizophrenia, in which they compared outcomes in three developing countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia, to outcomes in six developed countries. They found, this was in the 1970s and 1980s. They did two studies, one two years in length, one five years in length. They found that outcomes were much superior, much better in the uh, three developing countries. After the first study of that sort, they said, oh, maybe the reason is they hypothesized and the, the investigators were, were from the Western world they hypothesize maybe the reason for the better outcomes in the poor countries is they're more medication compliance. They use antipsychotics regularly. So they measured that in the second study and they found the opposite was true. They found that in the poor countries, uh, they use the drugs acutely, short period of time, but not chronically. And only 16% of patients were regularly maintained on antipsychotics. And in there, you saw better long-term outcomes. Anyway, I don't really have time to go through this, but there's a study in the Netherlands that shows a higher recovery rate for those down to a lower dose or antipsychotics that had a randomized element to it. There was a Finland cohort study. They looked at everybody born in six, 1966 who got diagnosed with schizophrenia. 
looked at how they were doing in 2000, and it was those who had taken themselves off medication that were doing best. There was an Australian study where the idea was, this was first episode patients, we'll get them stabilized on the drugs, and then we'll try to make sure they stay on the drugs because we believe medication adherence is so critical, and it worked in the sense that their extra support to keep people on the drugs was successful, it kept them on the drugs. Unfortunately, medication adherence was associated with decreases in psychosocial functioning and increases in negative symptoms. There's an uh, OPA study, Denmark study. Again, it was 303 first episode patients that were still being studied at 10 years. At the end of 10 years, one third were non-compliant and they were more likely to be in remission, more likely to be working, had better cognitive functioning, lower positive negative symptoms and were more likely to have a romantic partner. You go back to baseline, no difference in severity of groups. There's a similar finding in, in Germany. Uh, real quickly, this is open dialogue where it looked at, this is a slide actually prepared by Yako. He's just looking at five years, psychotic symptoms at five years. He, and it's, it's for those who didn't use antipsychotics all during the first two years versus those who did. And you'll see that 85% of those who were not exposed to antipsychotics in the first two years were asymptomatic at the end of five years. So what this is really good evidence for is if you can take first evidence, first episode people who haven't been exposed uh, and you can give them psychosocial support, open dialogue support, a high percentage of them can recover and they will, have, they will be a group with particularly good long-term outcomes. This was a comparison done between Western Lapland treatment and a similar type, I think, of dialogical treatment in Stockholm and what you, uh, what you saw here was a difference in neuroleptic use. You see neuroleptic use in, in, in Western Lapland was 33% of five years. Uh, in Stockholm, it was 93%, 91, 92 is the recruitment period. They're still following them for five years. Look at the difference on disability alliance. 19% for the open dialogue, you know, the, the patients in, in Western Lapland where they were treated with selective use versus 62% in Stockholm. So what I think we have is a large body of research that is telling us that with psychotic patients, for open dialogue really to be successful, you need to adopt the selective use model. Um, so uh, it's a challenge, and I know there's many challenges because it's even hard to get first episode patients that are, are not on medication. But um, I, I think, there is such a concise and uh, a body of evidence that is telling us that over the long term, in the aggregate, antipsychotics have this negative effect. Uh, this is a quote from Yako uh, talking about this, about the importance of this, and you can read it yourself. I'm confident of this idea. There are patients who may be living in a quite peculiar way and they may have psychotic ideas, but they still can hang on to an active life. But if they're medicated because of the sedative action of the drugs, they lose the script in life. And that is so important. They become passive and they no longer take care of themselves. So that's those a final word from, uh, as you all know, the person who led the research into this. And so my, my question to everybody here is, is it time as open dialogue um, is adapted, spreads, is it time to address this question of antipsychotic use for psychotic patients. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Bob. I'm going to jump in and uh, turn to some of the questions. Um, the first question has to do with how to convince um, psychiatrists that this is evidence based. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and I'm going to take the um, the prerogative of being uh, getting to ask questions to add to that that. For me, another elephant in this room is, um, you, you should turn on your video, but um, is that if you look at the Harrow work, um, you don't see a separation until two years. And I, I think two years for some people, um, families, clinicians living with someone in an altered state is, is not trivial. And when there's so much um, pressure 
to, to subdue the symptoms. It's, it's hard. I mean, I, I experienced that. So I guess I'll add that on, you know, what do you do about that two year time and sort of pushing back on the narrative and just in general to honor the person who asked the question, how do you, um, convince psychiatrists? Yeah. No, I think this is this, that's a two part question and they're <laughs> both really good. The first part is that, and, you know, psychiatry says it's an evidence-based discipline. And if you review the literature, uh, which is the review of the evidence space, this message comes out over and over again of studies of many, many types. It's not just Martin Harrow, but it comes out in longitudinal studies. You actually see it coming out even when the antipsychotic medications are introduced in the 1950s. You see it from different types of studies. And here's the important thing. The longitudinal studies, the outcome studies are consistent with sort of mechanism of action on the brain. The blockade, the dope, you know, the compensation and the brain shrinkage. So that's actually a very coherent, coherent story of evidence. Now the question is, how do you apply it? That's a great question. I think you begin with this question of the sense of who are you meant to serve as psychiatrists, first of all? And that's not an easy answer, but let's just say you're supposed to really serve the person and you have a person's fate in your hands, then there's this really responsibility to try to set up structures that can maintain, help people maintain a safety during these two, first two years, as you say. At the same time, I think that's one of the things we need to learn from what they did in open dialogue up in Western Lapland, because somehow, they managed to keep people safe with this selective use model. Now, I think Soteria houses are all, you know, I visited the Soteria houses in Israel. There were psychotic people there, but they were in environments that were non-threatening. You could be crazy, so to speak. And there was something about those environments themselves that diminished the violence, but also removed the burden from the families because there was sort of a holding space. So I, I think the answer to this is, this is the challenge. The challenge is to figure out how do we help and, and keep people safe and help families and help the individuals during these first two years. Now, I spoke to Martin, uh, Tom Job recently about this question. And what was really interesting is he said, you know, the people that left here, they were not doing well. They actually were doing poorly. And that's why they left care. And they were fighting often with their families too for that reason. And they really sort of like removed themselves from society, found other places to be, and then they gradually re-entered. They did this on their own somehow. By and large, there wasn't support for this. That wasn't part of the study. So I, I think one of the real opportunities with open dialogue, if they recognize the uh, elephant in the room is how can they build systems that keep people safe, work with families, even if people have this sort of psychotic thoughts, behaviors that that do extend through longer periods of time. Thanks, Bob. I mean, a lot of the questions do have to talk, have to do with convincing people. And I, again, I'll just take my prerogative. I, it's the one idea I have is that. I do think merging with Joanna Moncrief's idea of a drug center paradigm is a way to shift the conversation because you're not talking about treating an illness, but you're talking about what these drugs do and don't do. But I'll move on. Um, well, Sandy, can I yeah. add that's actually a model that's very consistent with a selective use model? Yeah. Because that is a model that talks about for whom and for how long do you have this aid with you? That's a selective use question. That's a best use question. So I think it fits with Joanna's well, conception very well. Yeah, no, I, and you know, what I, being a psychiatrist and sort of knowing that mental state, it, I think people need a rationale to think about what they're doing. And if you're, if you're staying with this disease model, it's very hard to rationalize what you're doing. Um, but anyway, I, I don't wanna take up too much time because there's a lot of questions. One of the questions has to do with someone who does a lot of this work um, and finds it easier to do the selective model when starting with someone, but when there are people that have come and have been on medications and want to come off, uh, they were asking about 
uh, deprescribing, stopping medications in the context of um, open dialogue. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, no, I, you know, I think this is part of the problem today is people get medicated so early and often they may be also using a lot of other psychoactive drugs. So a lot of the first episode patients you used to see aren't showing up medication naive, right? They're, they're showing up having been on psychoactive drugs, et cetera, or they enter open dialogue after they've been in care for some time. And the dopamine supersensitivity hypothesis is telling you it can be really difficult to ha have people come off. I will say this, there are, there are surveys that have been done recently related to the tapering of antipsychotics, large surveys where they interview people that went through that process. People say, and here's the bottom line message you see from those surveys. Some of them say, yeah, being on antipsychotics will help the time, you know, it, it reduce some of the pain, et cetera. But they, they, they pretty soon experience them as a barrier to recovery because they couldn't mount their, they couldn't engage with their full emotions, their full cognitive, et cetera, et cetera. I think you can learn from their, their experiences. How can you help uh, people taper successfully? Because many of them did. But what you do see in those surveys is there's a, there's a gauntlet they have to run of withdrawal symptoms. And I hate to say it, but it's pretty clear that the more drugs you've been on and the longer you've been on, that deprescribing process becomes much more complicated and risky and perhaps and undoubtedly chance of success diminishes. I, I don't mean to be so negative, but I think that's 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 a truth. Well, I mean, I would just add that. I think it's a problem if we talk about on meds or off meds, because I think dose reduction is much more doable and is a harm reduction approach. So, uh, for instance, you know, being on 300 milligrams of clozapine versus 50 um, is bound to make a difference. And so that also opens up a room for a conversation with a lot of different people. Because, like, in the you didn't talk about wondering, wondering today, but you know, his he has data on lower dosing, low doses being less harmful. So, that's just yeah, his hard. recovery rate is really for people who either got off or down to low, down to low. low. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and it makes right. sense. Um, I just we have a, a couple minutes, and so I'm gonna we have a question that I know is a, a, a something you've written a lot about and I would recommend psychiatry under the influence to people who want more than two minutes of Bob on this topic, but it's what about the related elephant in the room, which seems to be the huge influence of money from big pharma uh, and the interest of the mental health industry on our treatments and system of care. <laughs> so we can close with you answering that. Yeah. Well, of course, that's a huge problem. I mean, the problem is that farm. Well, OK, obviously, the pharmaceutical industry wants to maintain its market, okay, and expand its markets. And so they're gonna from they're gonna conduct studies that give them that results, because you can design studies and then you can spin your results. Um, and then they're gonna promote that through continuing education and et cetera, et cetera. So that is a, a very bad influence. But the real problem, Sandy, I think is the guilt. Because the the society looks to, we look to doctors, we look to the professionals to tell us to be good, uh, honest storytellers of their own evidence base, okay? That's who we look to say, this is what we should do. So the problem is, first of all, of course, many, for a time, many academic psychiatrists were taking money from pharmaceutical companies and they basically became, uh, they legitimized whatever pharmaceutical companies wanted to do. But the other problem is, is that psychiatry as a guild, they have a product to defend because that is their product that separates them, fr frankly, from psychosocial care. And it's hard for a guild to start saying, oh, our product may be harming people. It's almost you can't do it. You know, there's a new study, a new a thing, I think it's on um, a new series coming out on, is it National Public Broadcasting or PBS in the United States. You know who it's sponsored by? It's on mental illness. You know who it's sponsored by? Pharmaceutical companies. Do you know who the big talkers are? It's it's Lieberman. Okay, so it's it's biological guys. So the answer is this is a frustrating part 
And somehow I think the open dialogue movement, in fact, is a way to say to the profession, you got to rethink what you're doing. And on one last note, what did the World Health Organization declare? What has the UN Special Rapporteur for Health declared? We need a revolution in mental health away from the disease model to a psychosocial model. And if you look at the recent World Health Organization report, which was issued on January, June 10th, excuse me, they highlighted things like superior project, respite houses, uh, you know, basal exposure therapy in Norway. That's a way of getting people off medication. By the way, there's something to be learned from there because they've been pretty successful at getting chronic patients off. So I think we're at a moment where we do need a different narrative. Psychiatry's got to develop a different narrative. By the way, I think younger psychiatrists are much more invested in a new narrative because they weren't raised in the disease narrative. But you know what? This is a challenge. This is a chance for uh, professionals, therapists to join with peers with lived experience to do something fantastic, to remake possibilities, to remake opportunities for people who have the misfortune to become psychotic. This is a great moment. And if you have the who behind it, you have open dialogue being, uh, you know, practiced and taught because that has a different conception. And now <laughs> my final plea is incorporate the evidence base around antipsychotics into your thinking. Well, that's a great uh, note. And I do want to say at this meeting, I've had the pleasure of meeting some of these really wonderful younger uh, psychiatrists and non psychiatrists as well, who I do think offer some hope. And uh, I want to thank you, Bob, for another great talk and for everything you've done. I, you've been uh, just such a major um, influence on this work in the world. And I, 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 I and so many will be forever in your debt. So thank you. Well, thanks. That's really kind, Sandy. And thanks for having me, Rafaela. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you.